Hello everybody, this is Dr. Anju Singh um, and this lecture is going to be on exercise 39, female reproductive system uh, structure and function from our lab manual. So the female reproductive system is made up of um, the uterus. Um, let me see if I can show you here. So this right here, that's the, this is pretty much all the uterus right here. The fallopian tubes and these right here are the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. These here are the ovaries. Uh, the fallopian tube, uh, the lateral end of the fallopian tube is known as the infundibulum. So you see these finger-like projections on the lateral end. These are the uh, fibrae that come out, uh, the finger-like projections, and this pouch-like area is known as the infundibulum. Then the lateral, uh, two-thirds of it, this is the ampulla. It's a, a wider part of the um, fallopian tubes. And then closer to the uterus, the slightly more narrow part is known as the isthmus. The isthmus opens into the lateral walls of the uterus. All right, so the uh, female reproductive system, the uh, oocytes, the gametes, are produced in the ovary and carried through the um, uterine tube into the uterus uh, where the fertilized zygote implants to grow into a fetus. The female reproductive system also consists of the vagina, the external genitalia, and the mammary gland. So we have the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, uh, the uterus, the vagina, the external geni uh, genitalia, the mammary glands. And then there are other uh, structures like the ligaments uh, that support it, and we will cover all that in just a minute. Just, uh, before I move on to the next slide, I want to make sure we've covered all the parts shown in this figure. Uh, the... I will cover the broad ligament and ovarian ligament in one of the later slides. So we've covered most of the rest of the stuff. All right, so this is figure 39.1 on page 655, showing a model of the female reproductive system. So the uh, ovaries, marked as number seven in this figure, is where the uh, gonads uh, uh, the ovaries are the gonads, is where the uh, oocyte is produced, or the egg, or the gamete is produced. The ovaries are about um, an inch long. They're kind of sort of oval or egg-shaped, if you will. And they're located on either side of the uterus. Uh, we have a pair of ovaries. Each month, an ovary will release uh, one oocyte for ovulation. And this ovulation is regulated by hormones like estrogen and progesterone. These are produced by the ovaries. The ovaries are um, anchored in place by three ligaments. First is the broad ligament, which is marked as, uh, labeled as number nine in this figure, the broad ligament. Then is the ovarian ligament, which is number eight in this figure. And third is the suspensory ligament, uh, which is number six in this figure. All right, uh, the broad ligament of the uterus, it is actually the double layer of the peritoneum, which attaches each ovary and also secures the uterine tube in place. And as you can see here, the uh, broad ligament, and as the name says, it's very broad and it helps attach the ovaries um, the ovarian ligament um, on the superior medial side of each ovary attaches the ovary to the uterus and therefore it's called as the uh, ovarian ligament. The suspensory ligament is on the superior lateral side of each ovary and it attaches the ovary to the pelvic wall as you can see laterally how it's suspending the ovaries from the pelvic wall and uh, anatomically for reference from exterior, it is at the lumbar region. 
and that is where the um, ovarian artery and ovarian vein, veins are also located at the suspensory ligament. All right. Uh, coming to the uh, fallopian tubes, also known as the uterine tubes or the oviducts, these are the curved uh, shaped things. They start laterally in a wide opened uh, infundibulum. It's a funnel shape in infundibulum that has finger like projections at its terminal, which are known as the fimbriae. Uh, the fimbriae have um, the movement of the fimbriae encourage the egg or the oocyte that is released by the ovary to be directed to enter into the ovarian duct. The uh, oocyte then enters through the uh, fimbrial end into the infundibulum and but sweep, sweeping like motions it is guided to the ampulla of the um, ovarian duct. Which uh, the ampulla, this consists about one or uh, two thirds of the length of the uterine tube. So almost two thirds of the uterine tube is the ampulla. And the proximal part of, or the proximal to the uterus part is more narrow, and that is the isthmus, which is labeled by number three in this figure is the isthmus and the isthmus opens on the lateral superior lateral part of the uterus so making sure i've covered everything in this figure number one is the infundibulum number two is the ampulla number three is the isthmus number four marks the uterine tube number five is the fimbriae number six is the suspensory ligament Number seven are the over, is the ovary, eight is uh, the ovarian ligament, and nine is the broad ligament. Moving on to figure 39.2, this shows the female reproductive system through a sagittal section. So a couple of important things to see here and I want to make sure my pen is marked. Uh, I should get a different color. I'll do it with blue. All right, so right here, this is the, number one is the uterine cavity. And do you see the angle between the axis of the uterus and that of the vagina? You see this? This angle is known as anti-flexion. Uh, majority of cases, the uterus is anti-flexed. Very rarely, occasionally, the uterus may be flexed backwards, and that is known as a retroflexed uterus. And the important clinical implication of that is uh, during a gynecological exam, number one, the patient must empty their urinary bladder before a gynecological exam, because if you can imagine if the bladder is filled, it pushes the uterus back. And therefore, if there's any palpation to be done through the abdominal wall from here, if the doctor puts the hand over the abdominal wall, they will feel the bladder and they will have difficulty palpating the uterus. Therefore, emptying the urinary bladder before any pelvic exam in a female is routine procedure. And sometimes, even with an empty bladder, the uterus can be difficult to palpate uh, if it is a retroflexed uterus. I will erase all this so you can you can start over. All right. So I did want to point out that one clinical application of an anti-flexed uterus. So the uterus itself is a pear-shaped organ. It lies posteriorly and superiorly to the urinary bladder. It is anterior to the rectum. So uh, this right here is the rectum. That's the urinary bladder. This is the uterus. Um, the uterus has three main regions. The fundus. This top part of the uterus is known as the fundus. Then is the body. Most of this is the body. And then down here is the cervix. And we'll get to more detailed nomenclature of the parts of the uterus in a little bit. All right. So main three main feature uh, uh, parts of the uterus. The three main regions of the uterus are fundus, body, and cervix. The body starts 
uh, inferior to the openings of the um, fallopian tubes. So if you look at the previous diagram, the part that's superior to the uh, fallopian tubes, that's the fundus. The part that's below the fallopian tubes, that's the body, till you come to the cervix. Um, and the opening, the distinction between where the cervix starts, that's the internal os. And then where the cervix ends is known as the external os. So this is the external os here. Uh, so this length here, this is the cervix. Uh, the uterus is a thick-walled organ. It has basically three layers. The innermost layer is the endometrium. The, uh, the endometrium is just a part of the visceral peritoneum. It is the outermost serosa, serosal wall of the uterus. Sorry, the peritoneum is the outermost part. Um, and it's part of the uh, peritoneum. It's called as the perimetrium. The thickest part of the uterus is the myometrium. Myo means muscle. Um, and then the innermost part is the endometrium. And endometrium is uh, the inner vascular lining of the uterus. And it's most of the endometrium that is shed during menstrual cycle. Uh, the myometrium is actually made up of three different uh, muscle, smooth muscle fibers that are in three different directions. They have circular, longitudinal, and oblique muscles. Uh, the, uh, although the uterus is secured in position by four paired ligaments, only two paired ligaments are actually usually easily identified in models. One is the broad ligament and the round ligament. The, brown, uh, the broad ligament, as we saw in the previous uh, diagram, it is not so clear in this diagram. Uh, the broad ligament uh, attaches the uterus to the lateral pelvic walls, whereas the round ligament is located between the two layers of the broad ligament. And we will see that a little better in the next figure. So let me just make sure we've covered everything in this figure. And I will erase all my markings again. Oh, well, well, we're at the next uh, figure. Um, this is figure 39.3. Number one here is the uterine cavity. Number two is uh, the endometrium. Number three is the myometrium. Number four is uh, the perimetrium, the outermost layer. And all of these, the endometrium, myometrium, and perimetrium is what makes up the layers of the uterus. Number five is the round ligament. So you're able to appreciate the round ligament lies between the two layers of the broad ligament. And um, it, it begins below the uterine tubes and it attaches the uterus to the labia majora of the external genitalia in the female. And in this, from this figure, it can be a little difficult to imagine uh, because you're probably thinking the labia majora is directly downwards. It's not. Um, so it does seem to go more laterally in this figure. So the broad ligament is between the two layers of the, uh, the round ligament is between the two layers of the broad ligament. Number six in this figure is the internal os. Number seven is the cervical canal. Number eight is the cervix. Number nine shows the rugae on the vagina. It's the uh, folds in the vagina. Number 10 is the fundus of the uterus. Number 11 is the broad ligament. Number 12 marks the body of the uterus. Number 13 is the external os. Number 14 is the vagina. And the importance of the internal and external os is that that part of the uterus is tightly shut, um, and which is normal. And uh, during pelvic exams, if for any reason the doctor has to go into the uterus, uh, that needs to be dilated with an instrument. So there is a procedure called, say, dilatation and curatage. It's a therapeutic procedure for uh, dysmenorrhea, for irregular cycles, uh, where the endometrium is scraped off 
um, and the only way that can be done is if the uh, cervical canal is opened with an instrument. Now, in some people, one of the applied applications of this, and in some people, the uh, internal os and the external os is not very well closed. And therefore, what tends to happen in those people is uh, it's called an incompetent cervix. Uh, these patients are at high risk of uh, spontaneous abortion because as the embryo implants into the uterine wall and as it grows, the uterus is not able to hold the baby in and the baby falls out of the uterus. So it is one, it, it, it's a common cause for spontaneous abortion in women. The other thing uh, I wanted to point out again from a clinical application point of view, the fertilization of the ova with the sperm usually happens in the ampulla of the uh, fallopian tubes and the zygote travels down from the ampulla to, through the isthmus into the body of the uterus and implants in the body of the uterus. Uh, sometimes, uh, not very common, sometimes the zygote may not implant into the uterus. It may implant in the isthmus of the fallopian tubes, in the ampulla, or very, very rarely totally outside the um, uterine, um, outside the female reproductive organs because the egg may not, the oocyte may not have made it into the through the fimbri into the infundibulum or into the ovarian duct and may be freely floating in the peritoneal cavity. So this region here, if the, if the oocyte was to be released from the ovary, it has to come out and go in here. This is the normal direction of it. Sometimes it may not go there. It may just be hanging around over here. And the sperms are able to travel through the length of the ovarian, uh, of the fallopian tube and reach here and fertilize the oocyte here. And this oocyte could get implanted in any structure in this area. Um, all of these implantations, anywhere in the fallopian duct or outside. Any implantation that is not within the body of the uterus is called an ectopic pregnancy. And none of these structures um, are designed to be able to um, have a successful implantation of the zygote and growth of the fetus. And therefore, ectopic pregnancies usually terminate again into in spontaneous abortion and are sometimes life-threatening because of the immense amount of bleeding. Now, if it is um, ectopic as in outside here, the, the abdominal uh, implantation I was telling you about, this patient will have internal bleeding. There will be no external bleeding. This patient will have internal unnoticed bleeding and is usually found in a state of um, hypovolemia and uh, co totally collapsed when they come to the hospital. And sometimes they don't even know they are pregnant because uh, it happens that early in the pregnancy. The other implication, the other abnormal implantation of the zygote could be, it could be really far down near the cervix. In this case, as the placenta grows, as the baby grows, and as the uterus grows, the placenta can get detached from the cervical wall. So this is known as placenta previa, if the placenta grows here. It's a placenta previa and the patient may start bleeding in uh, during the pregnancy, and that threatens the well-being of the child. Um, and, the, and they may not successfully carry the pregnancy to term uh, because of that reason. So those are just some common clinical applications as to why it is so important for the zygote to implant anywhere from the fundus of the uterus and the body of the uterus. Anyway, here is a safe place for the zygote to implant. The minute you come here near the internal os or further out, that's not a safe place for the zygote to implant. Anyway, beyond here is not a safe place for the zygote to implant. All right, moving on. This is a figure 39.4 showing a sagittal section through a cadaver. Um, again, pretty much the same structures we saw in the previous diagram, which is more of a model. So this is what it looks like in a real body. This here is the body of the uterus. The top part is the fund. Uh, the top part is the fundus of the uterus. This little gap here is the uterine cavity. 
right here uh, is one ovary and this is the fimbriate right up here the ampulla is here and then the isthmus down here so this is all the uterine tube um, that enters into the uterus the broad ligament can be seen here um, this is the urinary bladder that's the cervix so if you were to you know trying to get the diagram this would be the fundus of the uterus the internal os and the cervical canal the external os and this will be the cervix all right so you see this little dimpling over here that's the cervix right here um this is the pubic symphysis and we'll get to the external genitalia in a little bit uh, uh, so this is the vaginal wall and if you see the vaginal wall has a fold on it over here that goes beyond the uterus and this fold is known as the fornix and the clinical application of the fornix is some of the contraceptive devices like douche or caps are, are put in the fornix and they cover the cervix and that's how they form a mechanical barrier and prevent the entrance of a sperm into the uterine cavity um, sometimes if there is a toxic shock syndrome is because a tampon can be lodged in the fornix and forgotten there and that leads to a toxic shock syndrome all right posteriorly here's the rectum uh, this is the urethra right here now coming to the external genitalia um, so in the external genitalia of the female there is a little a pad of fat over the uh, pubic symphysis which is known as the mons pubis it is not labeled in this uh, diagram but we'll see it in the next one um, and the uh, external fold of skin is the uh, labia majus which is singular plural is labia majora there's the labia minus singular plural is labia minora there's an erectile tissue known as the um, clitoris and we will get a better understanding of the external genitalia in the next figure so we'll go over that more in depth here uh, we'll go more in depth in the next figure i just want to make sure i've covered everything here so going below the rectum is the anus and the external anal sphincter is here all right so moving on to the next figure this is a model of the sagittal section of what we just saw in the previous one and sort of uh, redundant but this is focusing more on the external genitalia too so number three is the pubic symphysis number four is the mons pubis number five is the clitoris number six is the external um, urethral orifice number seven is the labia minus or labia minora number eight is the uh, labia uh, labia majus or the labia majora number two is the vaginal orifice and number one is the anus This is figure 39.5 on page 659 showing um, the female external genitalia inferior view. The female external genitalia is also referred to as the vulva or the pudendum. It is made up of the mons pubis which is anterior to the pubic symphysis and um, has a pad of fat under the skin. The labia majora, labia minora, clitoris and the vestibule. Um, so the mons pubis, as I said, is the um, the anterior pad of adipose tissue just beneath the skin, anterior to the pubic symphysis, and just uh, posterior to that, and inferior to that, are the two longitudinal folds of skin, or, or adipose with a little bit of adipose tissue in them, um, and have pubic hair, which is the labia majora. So in this figure, number one is the labia majora. Um, medial to that, 
to these larger folds are smaller paired longitudinal folds of skin uh, which do not have any pubic hair. They are called the labia minora or labia minus singular. And in this figure, number two is the labia minora. And if you trace the labia minora anteriorly, um, that is the prepuce. So the anterior extension of the labia minora is known as the prepuce. And in this figure, that is number six. All right. Uh, the clitoris is a cylindrical erectile tissue, which is just posterior to the mons pubis, but anterior to the uh, external urethral orifice. Number eight is the external urethral orifice. So number seven is the clitoris. Uh, the vestibule is the area medial to the paired labia minora uh, and contains the external urethral orifice, the vaginal orifice. And in this figure, they've not labeled the uh, vestibule. But that area between the two labia minora, that area is the vestibule. Uh, the hymen is a thin membrane around the perimeter of the vaginal orifice and it partially blocks the orifice. And in this figure, number three is um, representing the hymen. All right, so number one is the labia majora, number two, labia minora, number three is the hymen, number four is the anus, number five, mons pubis, number six, prepuce. Number seven, clitoris. Number eight, external urethral orifice. Number nine is the vaginal orifice. So with that, we uh, move on to the mammary glands. Now, mammary glands are originally actually part of the integumentary system. They're part of the skin. They are modified sweat glands, but they get included with the reproductive system because in females, they secrete milk after childbirth. Um, and their activity, if you will, is more associated with um, the female reproductive system and therefore they get included in the female reproductive system. Uh, a couple of important things to remember is number that it's part of the it's, it's actually a skin it's a derivative of the skin it's a modified sweat gland and it lies superior to the muscles so it is literally a subcutaneous gland it does not lie below the muscle it is above or anterior to the pectoralis muscle um, female uh, breasts uh, are enlarged compared to those of the male for the most part uh, they have a large amount of adipose tissue uh, the main external structures um, in the breast are the areola, which is marked uh, with number six in this tissue. And the areola uh, develops, again, more um, post-puberty. The size and the color of the areola uh, area gets darkened and larger with puberty. Number seven marks the pupil, uh, the nipple. So those are the two external features of the breast, the areola and the nipple. And the lactiferous duct openings are, are seen on the nipple. The internal structures as seen in the sagittal section here um, and a partial section through the anterior view in this figure. Uh, the internal structures consist of um, the alveoli, lobules, lobes, mammary duct, lactiferous sinus, lactiferous duct, and the adipose tissue. So in this figure, number one shows the lobules of the alveoli. That's where the milk is produced. Number two is the mammary duct. So the milk that's produced in the alveoli and the lobules is um, uh, transferred through the mammary duct into number three, which is the which are the lactiferous sinuses, and then. Uh, to number four, which are the lactiferous ducts. So the alveoli are the milk producing glands. And they, as you can see here, they're arranged in uh, clusters. And these clusters are known as lobules. And several lobules together make up a lobe. Uh, milk is secreted from the alveoli into the mammary ducts, drains um, uh, the lobule, and then into the dilated lactiferous sinuses. And these sinuses then merge to form the lactiferous ducts. 
and milk is ejected through the lactiferous ducts into the nipple. Um, from a clinical standpoint, a couple of important things is in a lactating mother, sometimes these sinuses and ducts can be very, very engorged and they get so engorged that they can get a kink in them. And once there's a kink in the duct, then the milk cannot flow and it kind of backlogs and collects and causes a very, very painful swelling of the breast known as mastitis. Um, it's very important to be able to distinguish swelling and inflammation in the breast caused by an infection versus caused by backflow of uh, milk. If it is in a lactating mother, and both of these are common in lactating mothers, um, if it is not associated with any other systemic symptoms like fever, it is most likely just an inflammation from backlogged milk. And a good method to manage that is um, uh, warm compress and frequent um, pumping of the milk or frequently feeding the child. So as it keep um, emptying the ducts best the mother can, and hopefully the kink will go away and she will be able to empty uh, the rest of the milk out. However, in the presence of fever, uh, that could be a source of uh, mastitis infection because uh, germs can, uh, most common is Staphylococcus aureus, and it is ubiquitous, it is present in the nipples, and the baby's mouth has a lot of it. So sometimes it can travel up these ducts through the uh, lactiferous ducts into the uh, mammary ducts and cause inflammation, in which case the milk can um, taste pretty foul to the baby. In that case, you do not feed the baby and the mother um, has to uh, take antibiotics to take care of that infection. Um, and carcinoma of the breast is again a, a very commonly seen condition. Carcinoma of the breast can occur in both male and females. So it's not just the females who get uh, breast cancer. Even uh, males can get breast cancer. It is not common but it is possible. And there are many different kinds of breast cancers and we won't get into that right now. Uh, so just making sure I've got everything covered here. Number one, yeah, I did that, lab lobules and alveoli. All right, so we move on to the next one. This is figure 39.7 and here you've been asked to associate the function with the part that's labeled. So number one is the fimbriae and the fimbria's job is to beat together to bring the ovulated oocyte into the uterine tube. Number two is the ampulla of the fallopian tube and its job uh, is, well, this is usually the site of fertilization. Number three is the isthmus of the uterine tube and it's the narrow part of the uterine tube that opens into the uterus. Number four is the fallopian tube um, and again, its main job is transports the secondary oocyte towards the uterus. Number five is the ovary. Um, this produces the secondary oocyte and it also produces estrogen and progesterone. And number six is the endometrium, uh, which is a layer of the uterus that sheds during menstruation. And implantation of the zygote and development of the fetus also occurs here in the endometrium. So moving on. So now we come to oogenesis or the development of the um, oocyte. So oogenesis is basically the formation of the haploid ova. Again, remember the stem cell, the original cell is diploid. Um, and at the end of it, through the um, through meiosis one and meiosis two, we get a haploid oocyte. Um, in early fetal development, when the female child is a fetus, during that time, the diploid stem cell is known as an oogenia. And this divides to create millions of small germ cells, most of which disintegrate. Some of these oogenia develop into primary oocytes. 
So in this figure, number five is the eugenium or the eugenia, the primary stem cell. And number um, six is the primary oocyte. All right. Now, all of this happens before birth, before this child is born in a female fetus. So the, uh, some of the eugenia develop into primary oocytes and they begin meiosis one before birth, but they stop at prophase one and they stay there from the time this baby girl is born till the baby girl attains puberty. At puberty, several of these primary oocytes then complete meiosis one each month, uh, forming two haploid cells which are of unequal size, but they're both haploid, they both have 23 chromosomes. The larger cell of the two is called the secondary oocyte. So in this one, number one is the secondary oocyte. And the other one is known as the first polar body. Uh, the first polar body may or may not survive to undergo meiosis II division. Polar bodies um, are mostly DNA or genetic material and will eventually degenerate. In meiosis II, the secondary oocyte, that is number nine, sorry, the secondary oocyte uh, is number one. The secondary oocyte is number one. Um, that uh, begins its meiosis two, but it stops as, at metaphase two prior to ovulation. If ovulated secondary oocyte is fertilized, only then will it complete its meiosis two and form a larger haploid ovum or a second polar body. And number nine is the second uh, polar body. So that only happens after fertilization, all right? When the nucleus from the sperm unites with the nucleus of the ovum, then a diploid single cell zygote is formed, all right? So number three is the ovum, and number nine is the secondary polar body. All right, so I know this can be a little tricky, so I wanted to spend a little time knowing where meiosis one sort of halts at birth and stays that way till puberty and then where meiosis two halts and stays there till fertilization occurs all right so just making sure i've got all the parts covered here number one is the secondary oocyte number two marks the sperm cell number three is the ovum number four is the zygote which is diploid again number five is the eugenium the original stem cell Number six is the primary oocyte. Number seven is uh, marks meiosis one. Number eight is the first polar body, which usually disintegrates. Number nine is the second polar body, which also usually disintegrates. Number 10 is marks meiosis two. Moving on. So this is figure 39.9 showing the histology of the ovary. Okay, this is the entire ovary. Uh, the ovary has uh, regions, the superficial or outermost region is known as the germinal epithelium, which is a simple epithelium. Just inner to that is the cortex. So this is the germinal epithelium. This outer mode part would be the cortex. And then is the medulla. And the inner part right here, this is the medulla. All right. So you have the germinal epithelium, which is a simple epithelium, the cortex, and the medulla. 
the medulla sort of stringy looking and as you can see it has the arteries and the veins and it the cortex contains follicles these are the oocytes that are surrounded by cells so number one here shows you the primordial follicles number two shows the primary follicles so the primordial follicles these are the smallest follicles and they each contain a primary oocyte Um, and they're all surrounded by single layer of cells called follicular cells. And when we do the histology and a microscopic detail look at that, we'll see more structures in the upcoming figures. But right now, this is the primordial follicle. Number two is the primary follicle. Uh, the primary follicle, if you can see, it has got a layer of cells known as the granulosa cells which surround the follicular cells. So there's granulosa cells and follicular cells, and we'll get to them when we see a more enlarged uh, diagram of, uh, of this. Number three is your secondary follicle, all right? So the primary follicle matures. Uh, the, uh, the granulosa cells secrete follicular fluid. So you see that purple stuff, that's the follicular fluid that collects in the antrum. That area is known as the antrum. Um, and the follicular cells are the ones that secrete estrogen. The secondary follicle, which is number three, contains an antrum, the, uh, the purple space here. Um, it is filled with follicular fluid and each month, every month, one secondary follicle develops into a mature graphene follicle. Um, and number five is your graphene follicle. Now remember, at any one given time, an ovary has many, many, many primordial follicles and primary follicles, but only one will mature to become a graphene follicle every month. Again, occasionally in some women, it may be more than one. And that's when women may end up having uh, twins paternal twins when two ova are fertilized by two different sperms you can get paternal twins sometimes um, no, none of the secondary follicles mature into a graphene follicle and that becomes a cause for infertility and if the woman has never born a child before and has difficulty bearing their first child that's known as primary infertility um, and secondary infertility is when the woman has had one child and is unable to conceive after that. And the causes for primary and secondary fertility, some are common between both, but some of them are different. But we won't go into that details right here. So just remember each month, there are many, many uh, primary and follicles in an ovary at any given time. And all the different stages of these follicles can be seen in an ovary at one given time but only one graphene follicle matures every month and only one oocyte is released every month all right so number five is the graphene follicle number six is the ovulated secondary oocyte so that's the ova that's released from the ovary and goes into the fallopian tubes uh, once that is done um, Once the ova is released, the graphene follicle, what's left of it, is known as the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes progesterone, all right, and uh, undergoes disintegration, becomes a scar-like tissue known as the uh, um, corpus albicans. So number seven is corpus luteum and number eight is corpus, um, corpus albicans. And over time, all of this totally disintegrates and sometimes may not even be seen on a slide. All right, so it's not like scar tissue that we have on our body that a scar stays forever. And with age, the tissue, the whole entire ovary is gonna be scarred tissue. Um, at any given time, you may see some scar tissue from the previous cycle or two, but ultimately it all disintegrates and disappears. All right, moving on. 
This is figure 39.9b showing the histology of an ovary. So this is looking at those primary follicles at a uh, higher magnification. So the outermost uh, layer is the germinal epithelium. Number 9 shows the primordial follicles. Number 10 shows the primary follicles. So can you appreciate where the uh, primordial follicles and the primary oocytes are surrounded by the follicular cells? All right, and uh, number 10 is the uh, primary follicle. Number 11 shows a primary oocyte within the primary follicle. And number 12 is the primary oocyte in a secondary follicle. And this is a section through the ovarian cortex. This figure 39.9C shows a primordial and a primary follicle at a much higher magnification. So if you can appreciate the germinal follicle, and this is still in the ovarian cortex, the germinal follicle, and then that's the cortex. Um, number 13 is the primordial follicle. Number 14 is the ovarian cortex. Number 15 shows the primary oocyte in the primary follicle. And number 16 shows the granulosa cells. And here is a secondary follicle um, at 70x magnification. And in this, as you can appreciate, number 17 shows the follicular fluid in the antrum. Number 18 shows the primary oocyte. And number 19 shows the granulosa cells, also known as the corona radiata, because it's sort of like a crown. Uh, this figure here, 39.9E, shows ovulation of a secondary oocyte uh, from a graphene follicle. So with this, we're done with the ovary. Do we move on? Uh, now we come on to the histology of the uterus. As I think I mentioned earlier, uh, the uterus is made up of three main uh, layers the perimetrium, myometrium, and endometrium. This figure here, uh, 39.10, shows uh, the histology of the uterus. The lumen of the uterus is seen on the upper end of the slide. So that's the inside, the inner wall of the uterus. The uh, innermost lining of the endometrium is simple columnar epithelium. Number one here, that layer, that entire layer is the endometrium. The endometrium itself is divided into two layers. The inner layer, which is number three here, is the uh, stratum functionalis. Now stratum functionalis is the layer that um, each month the estrogen and progesterone stimulates this layer uh, to increase greatly in size gets more blood supply and uh, prepares to nourish the zygote after it's implant after it implants into the endometrium of the uterus all right however if successful fertilization and implantation does not take place uh, this layer sloughs off during menstrual cycle so that's the stratum functionalis number three number four is the stratum basalis that lies deeper to the stratum functionalis and this layer remains after menstruation is complete for that month and this is the layer that, that gives rise to the next stratum functionalis the following menstrual cycle all right and number two are the endometrial glands so 
So making sure I covered everything. Number one is the endometrium. Two is the endometrial glands. Three is stratum functionalis. Four is stratum basalis. And number five is the myometrium. So those are the muscle layers. Um, and uh, uterine tumors, known as a fibroids, usually occur in this layer. Um, again, just a clinical tidbit. If a woman has a fibroid in her uterus before she gets pregnant, sometimes once she does get pregnant, the fibroid and the fetus may compete with each other for growth. And very rarely, a large fibroid um, can cause abortion, uh, spontaneous abortion. And therefore, a woman who's trying to get pregnant and is having difficulty getting pregnant, one of the reasons could be that she's uh, got a fibroid uterus and the fibroid needs to be removed before she can successfully um, carry a baby to term. But those fibroids, they occur within the myometrial layer. Uh, and then there's another condition known as endometriosis where the endometrial tissue is found in abnormal sites so it could be within the myometrium it could be in the ovarian tube it could be in the ovaries it could be in the peritoneum it could be in the nasal cavity uh, but it's endometrial tissue histologically and it is sensitive to estrogen and progesterone and therefore um, patients with severe endometriosis number one they have extremely heavy and painful menstrual cycles but if they have endometrial tissue in these um, extra uterine sites they bleed during menstrual cycles so they if they have an um, endometrial tissue say in the nasal cavity they will have nosebleeds every month it's an extremely um, uncomfortable and painful condition and uh, it's one of the conditions managed by oral contraceptive pills to um, uh, reduce the discomfort to the patients. And with that, we end this exercise in the lab manual. I will upload the lecture slides soon. All right, thank you.